Okay, good morning. What a beautiful day. I mean, first Sunday of the new year. Uh, we, we're, we're just thrilled. We think about, you know, New Year's resolutions and what am I going to do different this year? Where's God leading me this year? And, you know, I'm sure we all made wonderful resolutions we don't plan to keep. But, um, you know, we, but we, we actually take New Year's pretty seriously in our house. You know, we, we spend the last few weeks of, uh, like, after Christmas... By the way, my daughter, one daughter's born on New Year's Eve, so she thinks the fireworks are for her, for her birthday. So it's hilarious. It was her her fourth birthday this year. But we always take from Christmas through to New Year's as a a time to review the year. What's gone on? Where has God been in my life? What has he done in me? And what has he done around me? And how have I responded? What has this year brought for joy and for sorrow, for, for challenge and for growth? And then I then we tune our ears and we stop and we ask. God, if this is the lessons and the things you've been doing in this past year, what are you going to do this year? What is, what is the lesson that I feel you've laid on my heart to go forward? Where, what are you doing in me and around me that I need to learn? And that's a, that's a hard place to land. That has very little to do with our sermon today. Very little to do with our passage today. Because it, except that in that time, I also kind of reviewed our series, our pre-Advent series. We were looking at Romans chapter 1 through 5, and now we're picking up at Romans 6, and just rereading Romans. If you get a chance, do it. Reread Romans 1 through 5. Amazing. But where does that leave us? It lands us today at Paul having articulated the core of his gospel. He then now starts dealing with objections and problems and the what ifs and the hold on a second and the wait a minute I don't understand kind of things that th- this is where he starts with Romans 6 where he's now kind of getting gritty and if I can now pick up out to continue this series Romans 1 verse 16 and 17 has that key phrase that that thesis of Paul's Romans 1 16 to 17 for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And I love that. Oh, fabulous. It's a great thesis. It, it kind of encapsulates his thoughts and his ideas about it. But we get to this point now where we just finished talking about uh, our morality, our, our a faith lived by the heart is not enough. The Gentile believers. Faith lived by the rules is not, by good behaviors is not enough. We, we talk about our traditions, they're not good enough. We talk about our inspiration, our philosophies, no, no, not good enough. None, none of it's going to work. None of these things, the, the tower of human aspirations can never reach heaven. Our tower of Babel can never reach the sky. It can never reach the throne. And so we see this picture over and over again. Paul is consistently knocking down all of our human aspirations and attempts to understand and to grasp God and to approach him and to to be satisfactory to God and praise him for that. Because if it depended on me, I think I'd be in a lot of trouble. Paul's argument is that we are so profoundly and deeply loved that we can never out we can never outdo God. We can never fail to achieve his love because his love is so generous and for us no matter what anyways. And God has said, "I love you so much. I'm going to put a bit of me in you to live out this incredible life." And so you have this this war inside yourself and the reign of sin and death and the reign of grace. And so now that's, that's where we pick up. So we'll read uh, and then I'll share you a story that I had this week with one of my daughters. It's really kind of funny. So let's read uh, Romans 6 verses 1 through 14. I'm going to read it from the English Standard Version. A little later I'll read it from the message because I really love the way it sounds. And uh, to be honest, if you, have, if you have the ability to have more than one Bible in your house, a the Message or New Living Translation is a fabulous translation and a great companion to having something more like an NASB or an ESV or even an NIV. Having two versions really helps you wrestle with the text. I highly recommend it. Anyways, so let's start reading. Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? 
By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in that newness of life. For if we had been united with him in death like this, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we had died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not passion, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Oh. Wow, I, I get shivers reading that text. Um, I, I, and I think, you know, sometimes our translations do a bit of an injustice to the text. We had a Romans 6 morning with our kids a little while ago. One of my kids was having a hard day and was upset at their siblings and decided to hug them a little too hard. <laughs> And so we stopped and we said, okay, well, what are you doing? What's going on? What, why are you doing this? So we tried to kind of get to the bottom of it. But at the end of the day, it needed an apology. I'm like, okay, you got to apologize. And so out comes the script that we use. When we talk about apologies, we don't like, I'm sorry, sucks to be you. We don't, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the truth is most of the time when we apologize, it's about us. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, whatever. And it's, it's not even thinking about the other person. So we practice other-centered apology. So here's what that means. Hey, here's what I did. It was wrong, and here's why. I wasn't sensitive to you. Will you forgive me? And you wait. Is there anything you need to tell me or say? What do I need to do to fix this? And that's a script that we, we follow, that pattern in our home for apologies. The problem is it gets a little rote sometimes, right? Some of the, I, I hugged my brother too hard, and it was wrong, will you forgive me? Like, oh yeah, you hit all the points, but you missed the heart, right? So we have to stop. Will you forgive me, mommy, is what the kid, one kid said. And you know, it's this hard moment, because here's the thing. Our kids always know we forgive them. Always. Always. They will always be forgiven. It doesn't matter what they did. The problem is, it's cheap. If you say it wrote, you're just checking the boxes to get the forgiveness you know you're going to get. So what? I'll just, I'll just squeeze them again tomorrow. Or, like, I mean, or I'll just steal the Lego tonight because I'm going to be forgiven. Like, I mean, it's just, and how do you navigate that heart that's willing to check the boxes to get away with what they want to get away with? And they mean well, but they're just not, con they're not in command of their own faculties, of their own abilities, their own heart. That's Romans 6 in a nutshell, right? So when we look at Romans 6, and, and I'm going to, so I'm going to take a little tangent here for a second. Paul uses many different styles of arguing Romans. Lots of times he uses very different tactics in, in articulating and arguing his point out of Romans. 
Uh, here in chapter 6, he uses a teaching model. It's very common in most sermons. So if you want to rank or rate someone's sermon, you want to look at a teaching and assess it, here's very simple three things that you do. First, you look for where are they addressing an issue. They address an issue. They ask a question. They contact a point of pain. In Romans 6, that's verses 1 through 4. Then you answer the problem. You answer the issue. You speak to it. That's Romans 5 through 11. Then comes the painful, so what? You apply it. You apply the teaching. You apply the content to the issue and to your life. And that in Romans chapter 6, that's verses 12 to 14. So please, feel free, scribble it down, copy it, and, and come back to me. You're like, hey, Zander, you know what? You really sucked at addressing the issue. Okay, it's helpful feedback. One of the worst things you can do to a speaker is say, hey, good message. And then they're like, how? They're like, well, you know, it, it, it sounded good. Like, it had a nice word. Like, we, I in particular, I love specific feedback. Good, bad, whatever. I love it. And I, I got to be honest, I have rejoiced over the, the clarity and quality of feedback I've received from Wes and from Wes and from Paul. They have been a life source to me in both the good and the bad of the, their feedback. It's been life-giving and refining. It's made great things happen in me. And so I appreciate it from you as well. And I want to encourage you to think, how can you be specific in giving feedback and support for others? So looking at Romans 6, address the issue. What's the issue? Grace and sin. Verses 1 through 4. Second issue, of all things, Paul talks about baptism. And then third, he talks about transformed living. So those, those are kind of the three sections. So the first one we're going to talk about is grace and sin. So how many of you have ever heard the phrase cheap grace? No? A couple of us? So it originated with this theologian and pastor during World War II named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, and during World War II, he sided with the, the oppressed peoples, the Jewish people and the the blacks and the, the ethnic minorities, all, the, all these people that were being targeted, he identified with them. He spoke out against the Nazi regime, and uh, it confronted him to wrestle with some very difficult things. So when we read verses 6, 1 through 4, he says, what should we say? Should we keep in sin that grace may abound all the more? I mean, what's so bad about this setup? We know, no matter how badly we screw it up, that God's going to forgive us. We know that, because that's how generous and kind he is. We know he's loving. So why change a good thing? I mean, I know how this works, right? I screw up. I'm not perfect. God loves me. He forgives me. Rinse and repeat. Where's the problem? Right? I mean, if God meets our badness with forgiveness, isn't more of his kindness and love a good thing? Like, shouldn't we just, like, I'm broken. Why should I bother fixing it if he's always going to love and forgive me? I mean, really, that's the same issue that I have having with my daughter. I'm, you know, I'm just frustrated. I'm just going to act out on it, and you'll forgive me anyway. So why, why worry about it? Why rock the boat? This is a fine system. It works. The God of grace and mercy and love loves me and gives me life in exchange for my badness. Why not keep going? That's the problem. Because really what Bonhoeffer said is that this is cheap grace. Here's a quote from him out of his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Now, if you haven't read it and you'd like to, I've got copies on my shelf. I'll hand them out. They are fabulous. But he says, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. It's baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. See, Paul rightly puts his finger on this. He goes, should we keep sinning that grace may abound? He goes, no, we can't. We, we cheapen, we, we wreck 
how wonderful grace is. And do you not, how can you keep doing that? If you've, if the life by grace has led you out of sin, why would you continue to go back to sin? That's like, that's like what uh, happened in the Exodus event. They've left, they passed through the Red Sea and came out, and then after they were wandering in the wilderness for a little time, they're like, oh man, Egypt was so great, we should go back there. Like, no, guys, are, are you forgetting how bad that was? Are, do you really, oh, I get it. You don't like that being in the wilderness here is costing us. You thought it was all going to be what? Rainbows and sunshine? Let's come into the promised land. Well, last week I actually made reference to this. You know, nothing good ever comes without some kind of fight. Nothing. There's always a fight, whether it's against yourself or against your sinful nature, that brokenness inside you, whether it's against your family of origins, how you were raised, and you've got to rewrite those stories. There's all kinds of things that we often have to fight to experience a kingdom life. And I think cheap grace is a very quick path to making excuses. And I don't want excuses in my life. I don't want excuses for your life. I want compassion and understanding. But I don't think that continuing to be in a place of neediness, continuing to be in a place of I'm just going to keep doing bad so that God can keep doing good is a place that's ever going to result in health and wholeness and victory. Victorious living comes from deep courage to take the next step. Even the one that hurts. Even the one that embarrasses. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, rightly puts his finger on it. He kind of preempts it. He goes, it, it's, it's baptism without church discipline. It's communion without confession. And, you know, that's where Paul goes. Where does Paul go? Sh- grace, should we continue in sin that we may have grace? He goes, no, but don't you get it? If you've died to sin, how can you keep living in it? If you've left the country, if you've left the kingdom of the world, right, how can you try to live in the same house when you're in a new kingdom? It'd be like me trying to live in BC and live here. Try to, I want to live in that same house in BC, but here in Ottawa, it's not going to happen. Like, I can't. That's a different place altogether. It wouldn't work. And so Paul takes this and he moves into this language of baptism. And you're like, hold on, what, why baptism? Why would you go to baptism? So, especially at the time when we talk about baptism, it's not what we tend to do in churches these days where a person goes into the water and comes back out and you're surrounded by Christians in a room. I mean, we've got the tank right here. I mean, it's, baptism was a very public thing back then. It was something you did in the river in front of the whole city. Everyone saw what you were doing. The people that loved you and the people that hated you. The people that are like, oh, that dirty good for nothing. Look at them. What do they think they're doing? Yeah, yeah, I want them there. I want those people seeing this happen too. Because when we get baptized, what we're acknowledging is that baptizo to be put under. We're, we're metaphorically burying ourselves. So that when we come out of the water, we're metaphorically res- being resurrected. The act of baptism is an act of obedience to die to that old life, that old way, those old habits, and to rise into new ways, new habits. But again, when you take a next step, always the enemy will be there to try to counter it. So when you take a step, next step in obedience to God, the enemy will always seek to frustrate and, and come against that. So, we t- so the language of baptism, it talks about citizenship belonging to God, not to the world. It's about identity. I've been affiliated with Christ. I belong to Jesus, and Jesus is in me, and I'm, I'm with him. And then the third thing is about next steps, where I love this phrase, next steps, because it's really easy to kind of anchor this thought of where's my next place in discipleship? Where's my next lesson? Where is God doing in me and through me next? And that's where Paul's argument out of verse 4 was. He says that we too might walk in that newness of life. And so he says, For if we have been united with him in death, we shall be united in resurrection. If we've gone under, crucified the old self, 
we can come up into new life. And so this, this theology of baptism is the theology of discipleship. It's the theology of transformation. And in many ways, it's the outward sign of the inward change. It's the outward sign of the inward change. Communion is the outward sign of the inward change. It's the sign, when we look at baptism, we think we're getting wet in a tub, and that's great because that's true, but the other side is that when you are baptized, you think you're claiming yourself to be part of God's kingdom, but you're really declaring that God has already claimed you as his. It's the other way around. When you come to communion and you think this is about you receiving from Jesus forgiveness in that moment, What's actually happening is that Jesus, having already forgiven you, is sharing part of who he is with you. Communion, as much as it is us trying to declare our union with Christ, is really a picture of Christ declaring the union he's always had with us since we came to him. And it's trying to live in light of that. And I think so many times we get it so backwards. Baptism as much as it is I'm committing, I'm going to do this, I choose, the real heart of baptism is not about me. It's about me saying, I'm dead. Come fill me. And so Paul's argument, he says, that for we have been set free from sin. Remember we talked about, just before Advent, we talked about the two natures in us? Which one do we feed? We're free. We don't have to feed the dark any longer. We don't have to. In fact, we get to feed Christ in us. We get to grow Christ in us. And, so, and unfortunately, I think the, the English text fails us at this point because when it talks about death, sin reigned through death. Death was the mechanism by which sin ruled in our lives. The, the damage, doing damage, bringing things to their end is how sin rules in us. And so as Paul closes this, he starts to, he goes from that answering it about, it's about baptism. He says, come and live in that life of Christ rather than, than sin. Verse 11, so you also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so Paul then the, goes to the so what moment. And this is where we're going to, uh, just a couple minutes. He talks about the Christ-like response. He says, don't, verse 12 starts with, do not let sin reign in your mortal, mortal body. But the, it, it's actually connected to the word for death, not just mortal, not, not perishable, but literally your deathly body, your body of death. And so this, Echo from Romans 5 continues through this whole passage. He says, don't, and the Greek's phrasing of this is very interesting because it says, don't let sin reign by means of your body that's dying, your, your physical body, your human passions and your brokennesses. Don't let sin run you through that to make you obey its passions. And I think verse 13 and 14 get a little fuzzy here, so let me read it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop a, up the message here so you can see it with me. The message does a better job than I could here, by far. So I'm going to read just the bottom section there, verses 12 to 14. If you want to put a full screen, that works. Um, right at the end of the second last paragraph, sin speaks a, here's what this means. From now on, think of it like this. If you're in Jesus, think of it like this. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue, and you hang on every word. You're dead to sin and alive to God, and that's what Jesus did. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead. Throw yourself full time into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. You're not under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. You see, that transformed living, 
What happens when my daughter hugs my son a little too tight? He gets angry, he yells, and sometimes he hits back, right? Sinful flesh. We're human. Tragically. I'm going to ask you to think of in terms of how can I offer a more Christ-like response. When, not if, when people say things to you, about you, around you, instead of responding in kind, how can I demonstrate Christ in this moment? It's always a great question to ask. Because Christ was compassionate and loving and truthful. He was always those things. He was always healthy. He was always respectful. But he was also always trying to love people, trying to bring them over to life from death. And so when Paul hits this point in the passage of Romans 6, can we, he's basically saying, here's how it applies, guys. Not only stop sinning so that you can experience grace, do we keep sinning? No. He goes, in fact, better than that. How about you stop letting sin run your life? How about we stop letting it make our decisions for us? We have a choice. If, you've, if somebody's done wrong to you or you think they've done wrong to you or been unkind to you, here's where you get to kind of make it really what it's about. Experiencing Jesus. So you could poke them with, hey, I'm not sure you know what you were doing there. But offer that kind response instead. You're like, I forget. I'm going to choose to forgive that. Hey, help me understand what just happened there. I, I, you may think you know. You may, you may understand. But it's all, always a lot better to have it come from their mouth. And if they're honest, they'll, they'll own it. But the problem is that so many times, I think, we give sin power over our lives we give sin power over our lives because we fail to give a Christ-like response, right? We're, we're like a train on its tracks. We're so used to this pattern of living and acting in our, in our sinful flesh, our humanness, that we don't take the effort, that fight, to offer a more Jesus-like response. Because when we look at Jesus in the Bible— the only time we ever see Jesus being harsh or cutting or, or insulting to people, the only times we've ever seen that is the last ditched effort to try to get through to the Pharisees that they're not who they think they are. It was the last gasp of loving kindness that he could offer. They go, you guys, don't you get it? Can't you see this? And Paul gets there. Paul's charging towards that. Don't, don't you see this? In fact, he started Romans with that. And so when we talk about the transformed living, the Christ-like response isn't the hostile. It's not the go-to. If your view of Jesus is straight to rebuke, I think you're kind of missing who Jesus is. Jesus does rebuke, but it often starts with, hey, here's some love. Here's some loving truth. Here's some gentle truth to see how you handle it at first. See, Jesus doesn't come out guns blazing. We're going to shoot down all that sin and get rid of it, because if he did, I think there wouldn't be a lot of left of me or anybody else here. The truth is that when Jesus comes for sin, he comes with his arms open and he says, just like I did with my daughter, come on, I, I get that you did bad because you were hurting. You said unkind things and did unkind things because it hurts you. Come in. And he loves me just like I love her. And then I say, look, that's not going to help you. How about, how about we spend a little bit of time talking about what drove that, and maybe we can redirect it. Because I believe at its base that when we can slow down, and that's one of the keys of discipleship is to slow down. When we slow down, we find Christ is more easily seen in us. And so, instead of following our passions, our quick, flash, hormone-driven, excitement, adrenalized moments, the best thing that we can do is to take a moment, stop our response, go back to God and say, God, how would you respond to this? And then try to approximate it yourself. That more Christ-like response. 
So going forward, Paul's going to start to distill that down a little more clearly. He's going to be like, okay, so if, we, if, if we've left sin and we've entered grace, if we're free and we live in the freedom of God and we get to be disciples, we get to be baptized and experience church discipline, we get to have communion and confession, we get to have the fight of our lives because it brings life. We get to have that. He goes, let's start getting granular. So Paul starts handling these arguments and starts helping people start to discern a little more clearly what it means to be a peacemaker in a world of adversarialness. Because really, that's where we've been aiming all along. How does God create unity between two people who can't get along? That's what Romans is about. These people can't get along. How do we create unity? That's where he's headed. And number one, check mark on your list, a Christ-like response. You are free from sin. You get to be full of grace. Not cheap grace. Not easy grace. It's the pride-swallowing, tear-streaming, knee-buckling, humbling grace that says, I am willing to be wrong if it means we can talk about your heart and where you're at. I'm willing to be wronged for that. I'm willing to die. And so I want to encourage you this week. That habit, that godly discipline, that discipleship, that habit of the Christ-like response, that pause and check in with God, God, how can I respond more Christ-like in this moment? Find somewhere to start doing that this week. Somewhere where you haven't done it before. Find somewhere to start pausing and going, God, how would you respond if you were here? And then try to start imitating that. That is a good place to start from Romans 6 in that newness of life. And so as we close... And then we begin our new year with all the new things that are coming and happening. I want to encourage you to think about what are your next steps in faith and life and Christ-like responses. Because as always, I believe we should go in grace. Thank you.